I'm Mark Kelly and Mr. Saltwater Tank, and this is Mr. Saltwater Tank TV. As much as I enjoy being at home, staring at my own tank, and spending time with Bart here, I recently hit the road and headed down to Miami, Florida to spend some time with a veteran in the saltwater tank industry. And while I was there, this guy gave me a tour of his personal reef tank. Now, keep in mind, this guy's been around so long, he's had a mullet, and now he's balding. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the one, the only, Mr. Julian Sprung. Julian, we're on the short end of a long peninsula reef tank. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Two other short things are catching my eye. Mm -hmm. Water height and stand. Tell me about those two things. This tank uh, was something that I designed as, as sort of a 40th birthday present. And so I, I had wanted for years to develop a, a tank that had a good standing wave in it um, and have a, you know, a surge uh, to be able to feature the Gorgonians like you see here. And so one of the things that, that I wanted to enhance was the ability to, to see that movement of water uh, in an open top tank. So I needed to have a, a lower water level. I didn't want to bring the water all the way to the top, otherwise the water would have splashed out. And aside from that, there, there is this design element where the stand doesn't go all the way to the full length of the tank. I, I knew I needed a certain amount of space for the sump. It's closer to the ground. Most stands are 30 inches tall, 36. Right. This is maybe 24? That's right, yeah. I, I wanted to keep the stand as low as possible so that I could get my <laughs> hand in the tank without having to get up on a step ladder. Ah. Uh, so it, it's really my uh, armpit height is what we have right ah. there. Uh, and that was a design consideration. If anyone wants to know Julian Sprung's armpit height, it's there it this is, tall. Right there. And uh, I mean, another thing you, you might not have seen, too, is the, um, the oh, tank is, is uh, sitting on acrylic as opposed to wood or um, styrofoam. A lot of tanks are sat on styrofoam. Um, the effect that you get there when the sunlight comes through the windows uh, the light comes through and the tank sort of looks like it's floating over the stand. So no LEDs, we're looking at halides for lighting. That's right. And it's not that I'm uh, dissing LEDs. I, I would certainly put LEDs over the tank. I have LEDs on some of the tanks here. Um, but uh, I, I do like the, uh, the look of the 400 watt uh, metal halides and then combined with uh, a T5 or actinic. Unfortunately, we don't have the T5s on just yet, but uh, you know, you can see a nice uh, uniform light uh, with just two metal halides and a really wide uh, reflector design. Julian, this is a reef ready tank. It's drilled. That means you got a sump underneath it. Take us underneath and show you what you got running down there. Show me the beast. Here is the beast. Um, there's really not a whole lot to show. This is um, basically a, a sump. Uh, water drains down, the uh, pumps pump it back. Um, there's uh, no protein skimmer. Um, all I have for filtration here is a phospan reactor with, act with our hydrocarbon, activated carbon, and phospan. Um, I've got uh, an ultraviolet sterilizer, and that's about that's it. it. So yes. why no protein skimmer? It's not so much that I'm opposed to protein skimming. Um, on the one hand, it's nice to demonstrate an aquarium uh, that, that you can set up without one. But um, uh, a large part of the reason is that with the low stand that we talked about and the, the size that the sump needed to be, um, it's not really possible to put uh, an in-sump skimmer here. I would have to put an external skimmer either here or behind the aquarium. And I may do that someday. Um, the, the given fish population is, is borderline on the, the uh, level where, where it could use a skimmer. I mean, uh, there are clearly benefits to skimming the water. Uh, most of my aquariums are set up this way. There is a pump with plumbing going right behind you. That's correct. What is this bad boy? Okay, this is a refugium. This is my means of nutrient export, whether it's phosphate removal with the GFO uh, or growing uh, algae. Uh, I have to get in here uh, twice a week and I'm um, pulling, yeah. yeah, pulling out lots of plants, especially on the weekends. Uh, so it, it, it's a challenge because at the same time I want this to be attractive. I, I, I like uh, having corals in there as well and if I, if I don't prune it, 
uh, often, then the corals get overgrown with the algae, which isn't good. Speaking of overgrown, this mangrove looks like it could take yeah, over the house. It, it, uh, it could use a little trimming. This is the same mangrove that you see on the cover of the Reef Aquarium Volume 1. Been trimmed and trimmed and trimmed many times into this shape that you see here. It, it needs a, a little bit more trimming. Look, you can see that that's gone right up into the uh, into the light. The leaves are getting burnt right there. Any desire to raise up the light and get it to grow, take over the room a little no, bit? No, I think it's it's as high as I'd like to uh, to get it. I want to keep that form. In fact, uh, I mean, I think this branch needs to go. That's a bit much. So this is your bonsai tree. This is a bonsai mangrove, that's right. Julia, nearly everyone loves corals. Certainly, everybody does love fish. Talk to me about your fish selection in this tank. Yeah, I, I have a, a selection of fish that uh, are some of my personal favorites. They're, they're um, not necessarily the rarest fish that you're gonna find, um, but uh, rarity does not necessarily equate with beauty and, and color. Um, you've got the trio of zebrasoma, the red sea sailfin tang, the red sea purple tang, and the yellow tang from Hawaii. Um, it's great to have them together. You can mix them, they don't necessarily fight. Um, Dory, the hippotus tang, uh, is in there in the mix too. I don't really need them for algae control. There's really no uh, algae in here. You don't see algae, although what's true is if I didn't have the tangs, you, you would, so they, they are doing some control. Um, and you can tell that by looking in the overflow and of course in the refugium, uh, there's no tangs there. Um, the, yeah, the Red Sea Sailfin is, is classic for controlling uh, bubble algae. Uh, it's definitely the best way to go if you have a tank large enough for them. You know, damselfish are, are, tend to be scrappy and people consider them beginner fish and junk fish, um, but that's not true of all of them. Uh, some of the damselfish are, are rather benign and you can keep groups of them and they don't bother any, anybody. Uh, and that, that includes these blue with the yellow underside. Um, I think it's hemicyania, they call them village bell damselfish here. So you can form groups of them and they're, they're not scrappy, they don't fight. Uh, so wonderful fish. These damselfish here, an aquarist uh, husband and wife in uh, Orlando had recommended them to me. They had said, these are really neat fish, they eat the red planaria and um, you know, really nice damsel, don't bother anybody. Um, when they're small, they're bright yellow. As they grow larger, they get more of a dull greenish yellow. And as you can see, they're laying eggs. They strip the tissue off the gorgonian and they lay eggs. And that's why he's keeping people away from yeah, it. Yeah, that's why all the beating up, that's when they get aggressive. Uh, so if you see little nips on anybody's fins, it's, it's probably this guy. Blame the damsel. Blame the damsel, but no, it, it is. He really does chase him. If you put your hand in there, he'll bite you. Um, they're not super attractive, but it's okay. And it's neat that it is, they spawn all the time. Unlike most fishes that spawn, you know, once and then maybe two weeks later again, you know, ones that are laying eggs like this, these guys lay several batches of eggs. So you'll notice babies that are ready to hatch now and then newly laid eggs. So they're spawning several times a week. So there's always eggs there, which means there's always food. These, these larvae hatch and that's food for the corals and the fishes. You don't so try I to like, catch them and rear them? No, I haven't tried to rear them. I know that um, Todd Gardner up at uh, the uh, Long Island uh, Aquarium uh, has raised this species. Yeah, and notice you have a harlequin tusk. Yes. Your harlequin doesn't get into mess with your clam. I don't see any shrimps or crabs in here, though. Uh, the harlequin was a bit of a beast when I first put him in there. That harlequin was pretty rough on, on the fish when I first put him in there, you know. Uh, but Beating not, people up? Yeah, a bit. Chasing a bit until he finally decided that that was boring and, and he fit in. Yeah, that was my most risky addition to the tank. It's one of the last fish that I added. But in any case, on the fishes, one of my favorite fish of all is the Indian Ocean Red Sea Regal Angel, one of the most colorful fish in the ocean. They, they hardly bother corals or clams. You can see it's not, not pecking at it on anything. Um, and unlike the Pacific variety of the Regal Angel fish, they're um, much more adaptable to captivity. They eat readily. So you have the rare combination of extreme beauty and hardiness. 
um, and a fairly mellow disposition. But I, I had had one uh, for uh, over 15 years. They, they lived much longer than that. Uh, but unfortunately, it was in a, a tank I had outdoors. It looked beautiful out there. Um, but uh, there was a power outage and it perished. It was the only fish that died in that power outage in there. It broke my heart. I'd had him so long. Uh, the true Perkula clowns, and that's the, the type that they call onyx clowns. I've got the blue eyed cardinal fish, uh, a relatively delicate fish, um, and not long lived. Um, I, I get about two years out of them, and then they become sort of raggedy. Mm. Uh, and then I buy new ones, smaller ones, and so I have a bit of a rotation. So in a way, they're uh, like some of the freshwater fishes that have a short life, unfortunately. Um, what I like about them is the blue in the eyes uh, seems to match the blue in the Springer's damsel fish. It's a complementary look when they swim by. It's, the, the two types of fish go together very well. I've got the uh, semifasciatus angelfish, uh, Gen Genicanthus semifasciatus. Um, two females. Uh, one of the females I got from Tony Vargas. And the female I got from him seems to be changing to a male now, so hopefully it'll be a, a spawning pair soon. And the flame angel? Yeah, flame angel. Hawks. Yeah, I've got the, there's a pair of flame hawks. Haven't seen them spawning yet. I look forward to that. That's something if they did spawn, I would catch the eggs. I'd send them to uh, Matt Wittenrich and see if he could raise them. Cool. Uh, I'd love to try to raise these fish, but my schedule just doesn't allow yeah. it. Fish rearing is a full-time... <laughs> it's a full-impact kind of sport. <laughs> we're looking at a whole bunch of Gorgonians, hard corals, soft corals, LPS. How'd you pick them? Okay, well, as I mentioned before, the, the main goal of the tank was to uh, focus this on the surge. So that's why there are so many Gorgonians uh, in the aquarium. Um, here in Florida, we have this wonderful resource of all these different colors and shapes of photosynthetic gorgonians, and they're very hardy, very easy to keep. As far as what stony corals I have, um, it's a mix of ones that are personal favorites that I've collected over the years from visits to various uh, aquariums, different people's uh, aquariums, or sometimes when I, I'm in a pet shop, I, I, I'll see something that, that I like. But uh, much of what you see here is from travels, uh, and talking in different clubs and saying, oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have it. Duncan coral is, is uh, very popular in the trade now, Duncan upsamia. Um, those are not recently uh, purchased. Uh, those are you know, several generations down from when I originally brought it into the USA. I had a brother who was living in Australia, and I, I bought a a little piece in a, a pet store um, and brought it here uh, and that one grew into a fairly large colony that I fragmented and shared with many many aquarists so um, you you see the offspring here of yeah. my original one oh, cool. um, there was a second strain that that my brother brought with him that's this one um, it grows a little bit differently you you can see in the um, imported ones these days. There, there are ones that grow flat and there are ones that grow upward with branches and that's the two strains right there. I can now say I've been in the house of Julian Sprone to get a personal tour of your tank. It looks great, certainly unique. Good job. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Mark.